well, so entrenched within the community as in, you know, the president of Drawdown Switzerland. So we really want to start by addressing what Drawdown is. Um, so in light of all that, sorry that it cut off a minute short. Um, John, could you maybe um, build on what we've just been seeing and elucidate a little bit more about what Drawdown is and what it means? Yeah, so uh, as, as Catherine was uh, explaining, uh, it's, it's all about solutions um, and uh, a research effort that really started in 2014. Um, and the book that was published in 2017 that, that uh, she showed you, uh, it, it was uh, basically the culmination of, of, of all that uh, research and it's published in 2017. So, uh, but since then, uh, the research continues and all the effort and the work uh, uh, with new research fellows that are looking at uh, all the different solutions and we're adding to that research. And Catherine has gone on since then, uh, together with others to, in March of 2020, uh, wrote up a Drawdown review. Um, all of this you can access on the, the Drawdown website. So the idea here is to show you some, some resources um, uh, so uh, here we've got drawdown.org uh, and um, Julian, if you can just scroll down a little bit. So we thought we'd try to shake things up and sort of do a multimedia presentation. So we'll, we'll see how that goes uh, and do interrupt if I, I, I do tend to ramble. So, uh, so here you can see uh, the list of all those different solutions. Uh, and the figures that are in the scenarios are gigatons that are either reduced, avoided, or sequestered for that uh, scenario. And if you click on uh, scenario two, um, and uh, again, so that you can get the, the ranking, uh, what Drawdown did is research and modeled all of these solutions uh, into the future. So this is a super uh, a resource for, for anybody um, to, to basically uh, understand at a very high level, of course, what are all those solutions? Because all of these um, um, have impact in terms of uh, in terms of, of climate, um, and uh, you can you can see the, those two scenarios. Actually. Scenario two uh, co corresponds to 1.5 degrees C uh, warming, so you'll see bigger numbers there, um, and and so uh, uh, what's also happened is that. Uh, the book has now been translated in several languages, and there was a recent conference at the beginning of this year uh, where a lot more work was also presented. Julian? Apologies, I'm always on this. Yeah. Um, can you explain why Drawdown is so revolutionary for sustainability and why um, the climate solutions are much more than just about the climate? Right, so uh, um, what's really exciting about uh, the, the way the climate solutions were, were, were researched uh, is that the emphasis was really on um, also looking at uh, solutions uh, in terms of all of their impacts, uh, not just on, on climate. And so uh, what, uh, what Drawdown found is that uh, it's really a system of solutions uh, that need to interact. And uh, just uh, very recently, uh, a, a really important uh, uh, work was published, uh, which showed the links between uh, Drawdown's uh, climate solutions to, um, to all of the SDGs, and it has positive impacts uh, we heard already just uh, one on, on, on education uh, in the video. Uh, and so what they did, and it's sort of represented uh, visually uh, here, is uh, the impact on all the, on all the uh, SDGs. So, uh, so that's what's really exciting about uh, these climate solutions is all the, the positive benefits that they can, they can, they can have. So uh, not just on climate, of course. Uh, and the other, the other aspect um, I would say, and the reason that this is much more than, than just climate is that it really represents uh, a vision of the world that we want uh, uh, with uh, uh, much less uh, pollution of the air and, and, and so on. And uh, another resource, resource I wanted to, to share with you 
um, and I don't know if you can um, sh go to the Solutions Project. This is a fantastic uh, uh, resource and uh, we're still at a very high level, but I think this is a great, um, uh, draw so both drawdown.org and the solutionsproject.org uh, provide some interesting tools that I, I just wanted to share with you. So uh, here's a map of the world and uh, what um, uh, was, was, was jumped by Mark Jacobson at Stanford with uh, other uh, researchers was basically to try to understand uh, what the energy mix for 143 countries would look like uh, if we were to go to 100% renewable. So if you just click on uh, perhaps Poland, uh, Poland's a good example. Uh, so what they did is they, they showed uh, what the different uh, uh, renewable energies would be for in this case, Poland. So you have onshore wind, 45%, it's a big part of it, uh, and so on. Uh, and that's to get to 100% renewable mix. And if you scroll down, and this is where you can see some of the other impacts, you know, uh, decent work in terms of jobs uh, created. Um, and uh, renewables have the great advantage of basically taking that, that wind and that sun and converting it directly into energy. Which means that if you if you have a look at the uh, energy demand, it's it's drastically decreased because you don't need to do all the refining and the transportation and and so on of the um, of fossil fuels. Uh, and then there are lots of other really important uh, benefits, of course, uh, in terms of health health care cost savings. We've been discussing a lot of like the I want to say macro level changes and quite large scale changes. And I think a lot of these changes uh, from drawdown, uh, besides from the individual ones, uh, it can be hard for individuals to think how they can enact them uh, in their communities and across the country. But I know you've written a, a wonderful piece very recently about what people can do sort of from the bottom up. What are some easy bottom up solutions that people can adopt into their daily life, for example, straight away to help mitigate climate change? Right. So uh, this, this is one of them uh, that we're, we're just discussing now. Uh, it's, I, we did a list of, uh, I did a list of seven. Uh, and then um, Antoinette Vermillier, uh, who I love to work with as well. She's a fantastic leader in, in the climate space. Uh, she jumped in and she said, well, I'm going to add, uh, uh, you know, since you came up with a list of seven, Let's have a week program where you can see uh, the things that you can do to start preparing all those uh, climate actions. So uh, here's some of them. So there's, you know, walk and cycle, eat more plant-based foods, uh, refuse single use plastic uh, and so on. And so if you, if you scroll, scroll down, you can, you can see the uh, uh, Antoinette uh, basically adding uh, a seven day program around that, uh, those different actions that, uh, that you can have. Uh, an important theme for me in terms of climate action is uh, uh, dematerialization, which is uh, a fancy word for, for basically saying, uh, let's, uh, let's have experiences much more than owning stuff. And, uh, and one of those uh, aspects that uh, I was really interested to, to read, there's, there's a lot of um, um, science and psychosocial research that shows that uh, uh, actually we get much more happiness out of experiences than uh, than stuff. <laughs> so uh, that uh, brand new car that you buy, uh, in fact, uh, the experiences uh, are the ones that will survive. The, not the, the fact that you have a new car that'll that'll wear off quite quickly. So um, and and that theme, I, I guess, is also uh, very much in and that these whole ideas of let's walk more, let's cycle more, let's not just get into a car, let's share uh, and so on. So that uh, we need much less materials for, for experiences that don't really, don't require them at all. So let's enjoy nature. And so those aspects really, I think, uh, um, you know, are, are much less impactful on the, on the environment. And they're very easy for all of us to do, so. 
I'm struck by the, the the days of the week sentiment at the end, which seems so straightforward. Just oh, on one day of the week, just don't eat meat, just for one day, or another day of the week, just use your bike. And it's those little changes that make huge differences. And I saw another another um, um, link that was set in that article about using different search engines, which people don't think about because honestly, like no one really has an emotional attachment to a search engine. It just sort of provides you information. Um, and you know, it's either Google or Bing, really. But um, I know that you're, you're a fan of Ecosia. Um, yeah. I'm also a big fan. When I, and that's what I mean. It's like no one has an emotional attachment to a search engine. Yeah. I do because I know what Ecosia does. So could, could you explain a little bit about Ecosia as well? Yeah. So, um, so I, do you have the, the Ecosia search engine um, there? So uh, this, is, this is fantastic. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's something that, can you imagine a search engine that plants trees? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we should all be using uh, Ecosia for, for our searches. So um, that's a super, and that's something you can do immediately. Uh, switch to Ecosia and uh, start planting trees. You know they've already had 119 million trees planted. So, so that's that's another one that's you know it's really is really a, it's a no brainer. <laughs> so um, they're moving away perhaps from um, less like easy solutions uh, and um, more on like a macro scale. Again, you wrote a really interesting article recently where again you bifurcate between the education sector the finance sector and that for you in order to really save the planet we need to be focusing on these sectors specifically and great changes needs to happen so i guess could you start by explaining like education what what changes do we need to see in the education sector for, for sustainability yeah so um well first of all uh there's uh, about 250 million uh, kids that are out of school um I mean, this is a, a huge human tragedy, and uh, uh, we really need to uh, get as many of those kids uh, into school and uh, being able to uh, complete both primary and secondary education. Uh, that's, that's huge because uh, those kids are, are just not getting uh, access to quality education at all. And so that's a huge gap. Uh, the other one is the one billion odd kids that are in school. Um, they need to, um, and they have been, you know, the, the youth movement uh, has been tremendous. Um, before COVID, I believe the last number we had was 7 million kids on strike. Um, so it was really growing, 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 and um, that needs to continue. Um, but what they what kids need at school uh, is is to have access to information. They need to be empowered about all these climate solutions, which we've been talking about. Um, and uh, typically, those things though are are aspects because because of the very interdisciplinary and cross cutting nature of, of, of solutions. Uh, it's they're everywhere, right? Um, and curricula tend to take time to evolve. So in the meantime, um, there are some, you know, some some fantastic uh, initiatives such as uh, the Climate Project and Eco Schools, and one that um, I've had the privilege of working with uh, John and Antoinette and Vermilia uh, bringing to uh, to fruition, which is the Carbon Free Campus. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people tell me, look, uh, it, there's no point; it's too late if you're uh, talking about uh, 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 kids because uh, uh, they're not the they're not the problem, right? They're part of the solution. But uh, by the time they're twenty or thirty, it's going to be too late, right? Well, I'd say uh, yes, maybe. But actually, kids uh, are a huge uh, influence on on us parents, and so imagine them coming back from school and uh, you know saying, "Why the hell do we?" drive all the time everywhere uh, and and uh, you know why do we eat so much meat and so on so it's really uh, you know empowering kids with with the best information and research on the different solutions that that this is really also uh, all about um, so yeah that's that's the the education piece if 
if I can summarize it that way. In your opinion, then, how would you rate the level of education um, on you know, surrounding climate change at the moment? Well, uh, really largely uh, insufficient um, and uh, much more needs to be done. And uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, this, these, uh, these voluntary programs, so for instance, Drawdown also has a Drawdown Learn. Um, so I think there, there's many, many different ways that, uh, that you, can, you can bring this, these themes into, into, into school. It doesn't necessarily have to be in uh, you know, uh, changing the curricula per se, because those things can take time. But these, uh, these voluntary programs of, uh, of uh, campuses wanting to get to net zero and, uh, and so on, I think are, are, are uh, you know, super, super partners for schools that, uh, I mean, obviously the very much is the case is that teachers and uh, what I've come across when I've talked about Project Drawdown uh, at different schools is uh, they're, they're, they are super, super enthusiastic and really excited and want, want more. So it's really, it's an open door that, uh, that we're knocking on. I would say so. Uh, so we need to to do more of that. Um, I'm seeing some questions coming in, but I just wanted to finish with the the second component to that article that you've written about the finance sector. So yeah, can you elaborate on the financial changes that you and Drawdown think really need to happen very soon. Right. So uh, so. Uh, uh, Margot also referred to this and spoke about the the externalities and and so on. And uh, what uh, what I've what I've noticed uh, uh, what I've been looking at now now that I work for the Climate Endowment Fund and the uh, the idea of the Climate Endowment Fund, uh, if I can summarize it that way, is to move uh, to to help uh, the process of moving those trillions that are invested in fossil fuels, cement, uh, uh, chemicals, uh, et cetera, uh, and to move them into uh, what's now being called alternative, but need to be mainstream ASAP. Uh, those, uh, those investments that, uh, that do no harm, that uh, uh, pollute much less, that are much less carbon in intensive, uh, and so, you know, that links back to, uh, you know, what we were talking about uh, at the beginning when we were looking at the co-benefits in terms of health and so on and so forth. So there's been, uh, there was a, a great study uh, done by the uh, IMF that showed that uh, fossil fuels basically had $5.3 trillion of, uh, of subsidies. Now, they stretch the definition of subsidies to include impact on health that uh, society is paying for, but that fossil fuels aren't. So, so that's really part of the solution is to price those externalities and internalize them and have the polluters pay, right? But that uh, has, has gone way too slowly. And the point that Drawdown makes actually is that all these solutions, because there's no carbon price in Drawdown, um, are economically viable. So, uh, so we need to help accelerate uh, that, that process. So renewables are accelerating faster and faster. Plant-based foods are the next ones that are going to be coming very quickly. Uh, but I think what we can do, uh, all of us, is, uh, and that's sort of coming back to the overall theme, is to find out what those solutions are uh, talk to and explain them to um, to our to our friends and colleagues, um, and in a very positive way. You know, not. I think that's another important thing that that comes across very much in Drawdown, in which I've kind of learned the hard way. Rather than say it sounds silly, but rather than say eat less meat, try saying why don't you eat more plant-based foods. The effect is the same, <laughs> but uh, turning it around that way, uh, I think is very positive. And, and you know, talk about all the, the benefits, the millions of lives. Uh, right now, for instance, our meat intensive uh, uh, diet uh, it means that 
uh, 11 million lives are, are, are lost every year prematurely. So those are things that I think uh, can turn around positively in terms of how a plant-based diet protects your, your health. Um, we're now getting some questions in that I want to pass on for you. Um, the first one is asked by Mia and it says, can you please expand on how you are encouraging local Swiss companies to adhere to Project Drawdown? And can you maybe share some examples with us? Yeah. So uh, what, what we're doing at, um, uh, at Drawdown Switzerland uh, right now is uh, our focus is not um, uh, necessarily Swiss local businesses. What what we what uh, what we're seeking to do is to uh, bring drawdown to Switzerland, uh, if you will, and uh, Switzerland back to drawdown. Uh, so right now, what we're also doing is we're um, uh, together with um, uh, Swiss uh, universities and institutions. We're discussing um, doing projects. Uh, that uh, will also be part of uh, Drawdown Europe Research Association. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, I was, I looked at uh, the original Drawdown book of 2014 and out of all the research fellows I could only found and find one that was based in Switzerland. We need many more researchers that are uh, working uh, on uh, Drawdown uh, solutions and, and, and so on. So that's, uh, that's an important area of uh, focus, and uh, in the in the near future, um, we're we're going to be, um, I hope, making some uh, announcements also in that uh, in that sense. Um, so that's sort of what the focus of uh, our our work here in um, with Drawdown Switzerland, and it's also raising awareness, of course, on what the different solutions and the different resources are. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Drawdown, uh, the book has been translated into French and German, two of our national languages, and it's uh, the latest Drawdown review was translated into French and Spanish, and so uh, it's becoming increasingly international and multilingual.